Hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar series here. I'll just give it a second for people to filter in. Okay, I'll get started with my slides here um, while people just start trickling in here. So hi everybody and welcome to the Invasive Species Center's monthly webinar series. My name is Madison. I'm a program development coordinator at the Invasive Species Center. I'll be your moderator for today's webinar entitled I Spy Spotter Lanternfly, Michigan's Response to the New Species Detection. Before we begin, I'd just like to acknowledge that the Invasive Species Center honors the long history of the First Nations, Inuit and Métis Nation people on the lands now known as Canada and strives to show respect toward their ancestors, their communities, and to them individually. The Invasive Species Center respectfully acknowledges that our head office is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, the Batchewana, and Garden River First Nations, as well as the longtime settlement of the Métis people in the Robertson Huron Treaty area. So just in case you didn't know, the Invasive Species Center is a not-for-profit organization that connects stakeholders, knowledge, and technology to prevent the introduction and spread of invasive species that harm Canada's environment, economy, and society. We've got lots of really great invasive species resources on our website, including species profiles, best management practices, and recorded webinars like one we're doing today. You can also sign up on our homepage for our newsletter, bi-weekly media scan, and event invitations, which is where you can hear about upcoming webinars. And if you're interested in invasive species and do wanna learn more, you can visit our website and check out our invasive species training program, which currently offers two different virtual courses on forest invasives. So, We'll be releasing new content regularly, so definitely stay tuned for that. Um, and you can sign up on our website to receive updates for when new courses will become available. So before we get started, um, I just wanted to touch on a couple little housekeeping items really quickly. There will be time for questions at the end of the presentation. So if you have a question at any time, just please type it in the question box and I'll read it to our presenter after the webinar. If you're having technical difficulties at any time, please type them in the chat box or respond to the email found in your registration and we will try to resolve that for you. We have also enabled closed captioning, so if you would like to follow along that way, you can turn that on with a closed caption button on your taskbar. And lastly, there will be a very brief survey following the webinar, so if you could please take some time to fill that out, we would really appreciate it. And with that, I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker, Rob Miller. Thanks for having me. No problem, yeah, um, thanks for coming here. <laughs> Rob is an undergraduate, has an undergraduate degree in forestry from Michigan State University and a master's degree in agricultural science from the University of Illinois. He has worked as a USDA Animal Plant Health Inspection Plant Pest Quarantine Officer on the Emerald Ash Borb Program and in private industry as the Regulatory Affairs Specialist focusing on regulation of genetically engineered seed. Currently, Rob is one of two Invasive Species Prevention and Response Specialists for the Michigan Department of Agricultural and Rural Development. So thanks so much for being here, Rob. I'll pass it over to you now. Thanks, Madison. So I will share my screen. Yeah, and we'll get the presentation going. So today we are gonna talk about spotted lantern fly. So Madison, can we see my screen? Yes, it looks great. Okay, fantastic. So let's jump right in. So spotted lantern fly. So we've got that pest here in the state of Michigan recently, right? So today's talk is basically gonna be organized by a little bit of background information on spotted lantern fly itself. And then we'll talk a little bit about you know, specifically what's going on here in Michigan, and that's Oakland County, which is Southeast Michigan, sort of Metro Detroit area. So let's start at the top and work our, our way down, right? So spotted lanternfly is an invasive species. It's a plant hopper, right? It's native to Asia and was discovered in Southeast Pennsylvania in 2014. So this insect has done a little bit of traveling around the globe recently, uh, both Korea in 2004 and Japan in 2009. And since its arrival here in the state, it's actually spread to 13 states. Since its arrival here in the country, it's spread to 13 states, Michigan being the most recent. So I've given this presentation or a presentation like it uh, a number of times. And every time I talk about spotted lanternfly, I actually go to Cornell, um, Cornell University's website. They have an IPM website and they have this nice map that they make. Every time I give a talk, I have to update the map because there's more blue counties. So all the blue counties that we're looking at here have spotted lanternfly. These sort of, I don't know if you can see it on your end, but these little purplish, little reddish dots, those are places where uh, an individual spotted lanternfly has been found. They don't have evidence of a population. 
Um, and those red lines are, are quarantines or county quarantines. So you'll see there's a mix of areas that are quarantined and areas that aren't quarantined. I should note, we won't go too far into it. We don't have time for it, but you know, in terms of uh, regulatory responses to spotted lanternfly, there's quarantines um, that states can stand up for individual counties or areas. There's also regulatory actions such as compliance agreements. And here in the state of Michigan, we're using compliance agreements. Uh, and that allows us to have our growers, uh, nursery growers, nursery retailers under compliance agreements that allows them to uh, safely transport nursery stock around. Um, I did mention nursery stock there. That's uh, gonna be an important factor in today's talk. Uh, we'll get some more details on that in a little bit. All right, so life cycle and identification. So what does spotted lanternfly look like, right? That's gonna start off its life cycle as a little egg mass, usually laid on a tree. Um, they prefer tree of heaven. So when we're looking for egg masses, which we just did last week, we looked at a lot of tree of heaven, but you have one generation per year, start off in the spring as that egg mass, they hatch and they go through a number of instars. Those are the growth stages. And when they first hatch, you know, keep in mind they're a plant hopper, they're, they're not a beetle, but I'll describe it to folks when I'm talking to them over the phone or I get a report. It almost looks like a little black beetle with white spots. Now I've got some um, images, some real nice images we'll take a look at in a minute, but just know that they progress throughout their life cycle. They don't always look the same, right? They're not just sort of a smaller version of the same bug. They go through this transformation and they start out little black bug with white spots all the way to this very, we would call it a very showy insect with these very distinct patterns on the fore and hind wings um, to again, the females laying these egg masses. Females will lay one to two egg masses. Egg masses contain anywhere from 30 to 45-ish eggs, right? Now those numbers will move around a little bit, but they will lay those egg masses and then cover them with sort of a, a putty-like material. And again, we'll look at some more images uh, later on. So I'd like to know how we get this up here at the top to go away. No, that's not it. Well, we'll muddle through. So here we have some images um, of the various life stages, right? So we've got that egg mass there in A. Important thing to know about those egg masses is that when they're first laid, they look more like a wet putty or even a wet chewing gum, kind of very about an inch long, sort of uh, rectangular or oval in shape. And then as they age a bit, they will begin to look like sort of dried mud. They'll get some cracks, in, right? So this a that we're looking at here, that's an egg mass that was laid, I don't know, maybe two, three, four, five, six weeks ago, right? It's not brand new. And then as I mentioned, those immature uh, instars or life stages, black with white spots, they take on the red coloring. And then we get that very showy adult, that, that sort of adult that you, you look at that and you think to yourself, well, oh, that really doesn't look like anything I've seen before. They're very uh, unique, right? Moving on. Some nice photos here is a close up um, first to third instar. So we got a first instar here. A spotted lanternfly like to aggregate. You'll find sort of a bunch in one spot uh, at all life stages. So this is a picture of some immature spotted lanternfly on a um, tree of heaven. As I mentioned before, I'll probably mention it 10 more times. Spotted lanternfly really like tree of heaven. When we're looking for spotted lanternfly in the landscape, we look at tree of heaven. Should also mention that tree of heaven itself is an invasive species brought into North America like over 100 years ago for ornamental purposes. And it's one of these trees that really likes disturbed areas, handles poor soil and pollution quite well. So you'll find it in urban areas, industrial areas, around rail yards, growing up through cracks in the concrete. Uh, one of those trees that is perfectly fine with a disturbed site. All right. Here's a fourth end star. We'll take on some of that red coloring. And then this is just a cool photo here, basically a nymph molting into an adult, right? And we've got that nymph molting out there. It hasn't got that coloration yet. You probably won't see that out in the wild. I'll probably never see that firsthand. I just thought that was a neat photo. All right, so let's take a look at the adults here. Let's talk a little bit about what they do. Again, spotted lanternfly on a tree of heaven. All right, so I said spotted lanternfly like to aggregate together, right? Um, We'll talk a little bit about how spotted lanternfly is a, a, a plant stressor, right? It's not really going to kill a maple tree. It's going to feed on the maple tree for a little bit. It's going to kind of cause a mess with that uh, honeydew that it ejects as it feeds. 
Uh, and, and then they'll move on, they'll move on to something else. So it's not like an emerald ash borer. Like emerald ash borer killed all the ash trees, right? Or a good number of them. Spotted lanternfly, more of a plant stressor, and it's gonna be more of an invasive pest that you're gonna see um, sort of public interaction or public nuisance, right? And we'll get into that in a bit. Males and females, um, you know, a little bit academic here, but basically, you know, you can take a look at those and you can, you know, figure out if it's a male or a female, this sort of red ovipositor here on the female, the ovipositor is what the female used to, uses to lay eggs. And also that yellow swollen abdomen, that, that's a female spotted lanternfly that's getting real close to laying eggs, right? So that's one that's getting ready to lay those one to two egg masses. All right, so egg masses. Egg masses can be laid on about any surface, uh, vines, trunks, posts, stones, furnitures. I've got some photos. They're laid in the fall. Um, we started seeing egg masses. We didn't see egg masses until probably we went looking in November, but I can tell you in September, I didn't see any, right? And, you know, a note about their life cycle and timing is that spotted lanternfly are pretty hardy. We were in Oakland County last week at this infestation site. And we were looking for egg masses. And I thought while we were out there, hey, we're just gonna find egg masses. There's no more adults left. We've had some days, some nights where the temperature got down to 28 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, 27 degrees Fahrenheit, pretty cold. You know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight degrees below freezing all night long. We've had some pretty cold days. You would think the spotted lantern fly would be dead, right? They, they go until they're killed by cold temperatures. But last week we found six live adults, which was kind of surprising to everybody. So they're, they're a little bit hardy, right? They, they will die off over winter, the adults will, but apparently they can handle some, some cold temperatures, right? So those eggs are laid in the fall, they'll hatch in the spring, I mentioned that. And you know, 35 to about 45-ish eggs, it says 40 here. You'll see different numbers all over the place, but usually 35, 40, 35 to 45. All right. Um, you know, where we were finding eggs in Oakland County, it was really kind of consistent. We would find them on the underside of small branches that were running parallel to the ground. So that's something you got the main stem coming up and then this branch going out parallel to the ground. And we would find them right on the underside of the branch near the branch union with the main stem. And these images that we're looking at here, these are probably from Pennsylvania where they have really high infestation numbers. We don't have anything like that yet here in the state of Michigan. Um, so we were kind of finding egg masses here and there, but in high infestation situations, you know, that tree there, that trunk on the right side is just absolutely covered with egg masses. And then we've got on the left side here, a fence post that's got some egg masses on it. And again, you can see that coloration is kind of gray. It's kind of brown. It does blend in pretty well with bark. So that, that made things like egg mass survey and, and eventual treatment that's gonna make those difficult. Like I said, they'll lay eggs on anything. We look at any of this material here, you know, you might take a camp chair anywhere. You might move across the country and take your patio furniture with you or your old dirty tire that's been stuck in the mud. You might take that with you too as you move across the country and voila, you've moved spotted lantern flies. So egg masses are definitely one of the ways that this thing can move long distances, right? You can have adults hitchhiking, but an egg mass is a, it's a perfect way to pick it up and move it across across the state, across the country, across the world. So we think spotted lanternfly was moved into Michigan on nursery stock that had egg masses laid on it. That's what all the evidence points to, right? So, you know, identifying spotted lanternfly egg mass versus spongy moth, which some folks might know as gypsy moth. The name is now, common name is now spongy moth or a potter wasp um, structure or, or even lichen, right? There are some lookalikes, but notice that, you know, spotted lanternfly is gonna be smooth, it's gonna be gray, and as that egg mass ages, it's gonna get some cracks in. Okay, feeding damage. So what sort of damage does this insect cause? What, you know, it, it's on the plant, okay, it doesn't belong, sure. What's it doing, what's the problem, right? We have all kinds of insects in North America that are not native, right? They're exotic, but they're not causing a bunch of economic damage or, or disturbance. So they're not considered, you know, an invasive species. With spotted lanternfly, they have this piercing, sucking mouth part, right? So that's kind of like a big needle or a straw that they're inserting into the plant. And 
it looks like they're actually relying on the turgor pressure or the pressure within the plant, sort of the, the, the water pressure in the plumbing lines within the plant uh, to think about it, to actually just, they're just tapping into that and having fluids flow through them or, or pulling fluids out of the plant. They're not really pulling because they don't seem to have any musculature for pulling those fluids out. They're more sort of passive in that regard. But they're a high throughput feeder, right? They're, they're doing more than just picking up sugars from the plant. They're picking up other chemicals as well. And, and those chemicals are in very low amounts. So as they feed, they're spitting a bunch of what's called honeydew out the back, that's waste. So that honeydew is a sugary liquid. There's still sugars in there from the plant. And so as they're feeding, they're stressing the plant. There's a potential to vector disease, diseases. We don't see a whole lot of that, but that potential is there. And they're also ejecting this honeydew that's causing a problem. That foul surfaces, it's sticky, it attracts secondary pests. So let's take a look at a video here. We're gonna look at this guy in particular, about 10 seconds in, I want you to focus in on this, this individual here as they're feeding, right? We can see they're moving around a little, but mostly there's feeding going on here. You'll see some drops over on this side of the screen, um, but then I want you to keep your eye on this guy here, right? As they're feeding, fluids are going into them and they're just ejecting the fluids out the back. Now that honeydew is gonna land on surrounding surfaces and eventually get colonized by what's called black sooty mold, which is actually just a fungus that likes that sugar in that water there. And that can foul surfaces, make things sticky. It can contaminate crops. You don't wanna sell grapes that are covered in black sooty mold. So what does black sooty mold look like? This is where some heavy feeding has gone on. There's probably a tree of heaven right around these plants here. Spotted lanternflies feeding, ejecting honeydew, and it's getting colonized by black sooty mold. So in extreme circumstances, oh, we'll get there in a minute. Yeah, we'll get there in a minute. So think about this. If you have tree of heaven in your backyard, maybe it's hanging over your back deck, your patio, your front yard, where you park your car. Sure, yeah, it's an invasive tree. It's not the best to have it there, but it hasn't caused any harm in the past. You'll have to excuse that. That's our PA system here in the lab. You know, you park your car there, whatever, hasn't caused any trouble in the past. Well, if spotted lanternflies in the area and they really like that tree, they'll feed heavily on that tree and they'll eject that honeydew. It gets colonized by black sooty mold. And it makes a mess. You can see here, this is a picture of some power washing that's gone on. The first step has been power washed. The second step has, I can guarantee you that is slippery, that is gross, that smells bad, that's attracting flies and yellow jackets. You don't want that situation, right? In extreme cases, and I'm gonna use the word extreme cases, we don't see a lot of this, talking to folks in Pennsylvania or other, you know, New Jersey, other heavily infested areas. This is what's called a hot tree, right? For some reason, and talking to the researchers, they don't, they don't fully understand it. There's some theories. Spotted lantern fly will pick or hone in on a particular tree of heaven that they really like. For some reason, they like this one tree of heaven over here and, and these other ones that are over here are growing in this clump or along the roadside. They don't seem to be all that interested in. So one particular tree is a hot tree. So this tree will be loaded up with thousands of spotted lanternfly. And as they feed, again, honeydew, black sooty mold, you get a mess, right? So this is, this is the most extreme picture I've ever seen. Um, this is not typical. I don't expect to see this anytime soon here in the state of Michigan, but this would be one particular tree that is really uh, attractive to spotted lanternfly. So you can see around it, it just looks a total mess, right? That is tree of heaven. All right, I've mentioned this already, but spotted lanternfly can be best thought of as a plant stressor. Uh, to date, you know, spotted lanternfly hasn't been observed to be killing trees outright, except for tree of heaven or some small saplings. And it is a cause for concern for grape growers. Tree, uh, spotted lanternfly really does like grapevines, right? So more of a plant stressor. The preferred hosts here, I just have a number of trees listed here. Um, you know, I do a lot of forest health stuff, so I tend to focus more on forest health and trees. So here's a list of some of the trees that you might find it on. And keep in mind, pretty regularly, I this list grows. You know, for a while, the talking point would have been 
over 70, you know, spotted lanternfly will feed on over 70 plants. The talking point has now moved to spotted lanternfly will feed on over 100 plants, right? So it's not that picky, right? Really likes Tree of Heaven. For a long time, we were wondering, does it need Tree of Heaven? Can it complete its life cycle without Tree of Heaven? Research is indicating that it can, right? They can complete their life cycle without Tree of Heaven. All right, where might you find spotted lanternfly at various times of year from May through October? Basically, you can always find it on grief. You can always find it on Tree of Heaven. You'll find it a lot on black walnut or butternut um, in June and July. And then, you know, we've got river birch all the way to silver maple there starting in July to August, going into when they freeze off in, in the late fall. Uh, rose, you know, multiflora or cultivated rose, I wouldn't use that uh, as a survey method. Basically, if I'm out somewhere in the state of Michigan looking for spotted lanternfly, I want to know where the tree of heaven is. That's your best bang for the buck, right? Okay, damaged other crops. I've mentioned this, you know, damaged the crops to date. You know, we haven't had any damage reported on any commodity except grape. They'll, they will feed on other things. There's pictures of them feeding on apple trees, but they don't, they don't stay on apples, right? They seem to feed for a little bit and move on. Now that may lead to some increased sprays from in an orchard, um, which you could categorize as an impact or damage. Um, but right now, again, the only damage that's been reported Due to spotted lanternfly on any crop is great. All right, management. A couple slides on management here, and then we'll talk about what's actually happened here in Michigan. And I've got some aerial shots and some maps. So for spotted lanternfly management, um, you know, stop the spread is is really what everybody needs to be working on. It's what we're working on, right? Uh, you can scrape and smash egg masses. A sort of mechanical means there. You can use. Um, sticky bands or sticky traps. Spotted lanternfly has a habit of crawling up and down a tree that it's on. Uh, they really like to do that. They'll sort of crawl up to feed and then they'll crawl back down. And these sticky bands, they get stuck in the sticky band. Um, you can remove tree of heaven. That comes with an asterisk or a caveat, right? You know, if you remove tree of heaven, they'll move on to something else, right? This is, this remove tree of heaven is more sort of the approach that was taken very early on. And we still use it in some cases. Um, I don't have a whole lot of slides on it here, but if we think about management and tree of heaven, one of the best things that you can do is you can actually create trap trees. What a trap tree is, is a tree of heaven that has systemic insecticides applied to it, specifically imidacloprid or dinotetron. So with the trap tree scenario or a trap tree approach, if we had, let's say, 10 tree of heaven in an area, we would cut down eight of them. We would apply some herbicide to them to make sure that we actually kill those tree of heaven uh, and prevent them from suckering. Um, and then we would apply these systemic insecticides, in our case, it would be down to to the tree. Uh, so that when spotted lanternfly goes to that tree and feeds on that tree, it ingests the insecticide and dies. Now, tree of heaven is not native to North America. So there aren't a whole lot of native insects that interact with that tree very much. So it's a very good, very targeted approach to lower numbers of spotted lanternfly in an area. And for number five there, uh, the good news about spotted lanternfly is that they are very susceptible to a range of insecticides that can be applied responsibly for control. So grape growers have methods that they can use to exclude spotted lanternfly from an orchard such as netting or they have insecticides that they can use to actually spray the vines, right? You know, stop the spread, don't move firewood. Any invasive species professional will tell you that that is critical for a number of reasons, not just for spotted lantern fly, but you also need to think about emerald ash borer, Asian longhorn beetle, uh, balsam woolly adelgid, hemlock woolly adelgid, uh, a whole, you know, oak wilt, a whole host of invasive diseases and pests can be moved on firewood. So the tagline there is buy it where you burn it. Or so you're buying, you know, you're traveling a hundred miles or going to a different province, buy it there, burn it there, don't bring it back, right? And then if you're in an area with a heavy infestation, don't park under infested trees and leave your windows rolled up. That'll keep you, that'll lower the chances of taking a hitchhiker with you. Right? You don't want to move a 
a mated female across the country so that that female can leave the vehicle and go lay two egg masses that have 40 eggs a piece in them. That's 80 spotted lanternfly in a new area, right? If they were all to make it to adulthood. Moving on, you know, scrape and destroy eggs. The thing about that is you got to make sure that you're either squishing them all or getting those eggs into a container of soapy water or something with rubbing alcohol. You've, you can't just scrape it off the tree and consider it good. If you haven't mechanically crushed all the eggs, they can still hatch, right? So if we're using a, a scraping approach, you want to make sure that you're squishing them all or getting them into a container where you can throw them out or something that's got alcohol or soapy water. Sticky bands, I've mentioned this, so they'll crawl up. This is an image of a sticky band on a tree of heaven. You can see sort of the signature bark for tree of heaven there. I've heard people say cantaloupe for the bark. We'll talk about identification in a little bit, but they get stuck, right? Some folks don't like these because other things can get stuck to these, which is true. We could get chipmunks or woodpeckers on occasion will get stuck. It's very rare, but it does happen. Some folks will even make sort of little exclusion devices like chicken wire that's sort of out away from the trunk of the tree. The insects will, the spotted lanternfly will crawl up and get stuck on the sticky band, but the chicken wire would keep the larger animals or any animals out of uh, the sticky, sticky band on the tree. Our tree of heaven. So I've said tree of heaven about a dozen times, probably two dozen times. Tree of heaven's invasive. Um, what does it look like? Right. So you're looking in a particular area. It's got these pinnately compound leaves. It's got this huge, huge leaf with a bunch of leaflets on it. Right. And the best giveaway, if you have leaves, are these notches at the base of the leaf, one or two notches. Right. Other one is that when you crush up the leaves, you'll get a, some people say peanut butter, some people say rotten peanut butter smell. Um, there's a, a pith in the middle. It looks almost like white foam, kind of. If you cut, cut a twig in half, it won't be just twig all the way through. It won't look like wood. It'll have a kind of a white foamish looking center, right? The other thing is you're, you know, you're standing in a wood lot. You know, once you find a tree of heaven, um, and there's plenty of resources online, You'll notice too that they don't they don't have as many branches as maybe nearby maples or or what else you've got in the area elms or peaches or whatever. Once they drop all their leaves, they seem to be a minimalist tree, and so you can really pick them out that way too. If you, once you get sort of keyed in on that, you can pick them out from a you know quite a ways away, right? So I would say you know if you want to look for spotted lanternfly in your area, find out what tree of heaven looks like and go there first. Right. Keep in mind that Tree of Heaven likes disturbed sites. So roadsides, anywhere where there's been construction, anywhere the soil's been disturbed, um, near industrial areas, if you can stay on that side of the fence where you're not trespassing or anything, that would be fine too. Pair of binoculars, you can look up and down a tree with binoculars. That's what we do. Um, but yeah, you'll once you key on it, in on it, uh, you'll find Tree of Heaven everywhere, at least here in, in the United States. I don't know. We don't seem to get that much moving that far north, but in the Windsor area, I certainly would expect to find a whole lot of tree of heaven. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about, you know, biology of spotted lanternfly, the issues that it causes. Um, let's focus in a little bit and let's talk about Oakland County here in Michigan. What happened? Sort of what's the story there, right? So in July, Somebody took a picture of a fourth in star spotted lanternfly at a, at a nursery in Pani, right? And then in the beginning of August, it, it was reported to Michigan State University Extension, basically at, a, at an extension event. Somebody walked up to the, the educator at the end of the event and said, hey, what's this bug? I think it's causing some trouble in our nursery. And the entomologist looked at it and said, oh, that's spotted lanternfly. That, we need to move on that. That's something we need to go check out, right? So I got this image from, you know, they sent it to me, uh, MSU Extension did, uh, it was Dr. Deb McCullough who had sent it to me. And it was a credible photo taken, we knew where it was taken, we knew when it was taken, we knew the person who took the photo, we talked to that person on the phone. And yes, saw it this, you know, this July, I, I saw it all throughout July here and there. Okay, well, we need to go check it out. We need to find out what's going on. There's Oakland County there. This is basically Metro Detroit. So all the way there in Northwest Metro Detroit. 
So on August 9th, uh, Michigan Department of Agriculture and Rural Development, that's my department, uh, the Department of Natural Resources, those are both state organizations, and the USDA, which is federal government, that's a federal organization, a bunch of us got together and we conducted survey. There was probably 16 of us, right? So you need a lot of boots on the ground because you need to cover a whole lot of area, right? This is an image here of part of a wastewater treatment plant over here on the left and a nursery retailer on the right. The nursery retailer is where the spotted lantern bought. That's where that image was taken. That's where it was first seen. We broke everything up into a grid. Uh, this is a half mile radius around where the image was taken. And we sent people to go look in various grids, go check out everything in that grid. And we looked at Tree of Heaven in each one of those grids and we looked for areas where we might find Tree of Heaven or Grave. And pretty quickly, about an hour into the survey, they called and said, oh yeah, it's here. We found a whole bunch. So basically we found a population of spotted lanternfly about 120 yards from the nursery, right? And with these sort of things, we have to send them off to USDA to get a full positive identification. And that came back pretty quickly. On the next day, they said, yeah, that's spotted lanternfly. That's the first detection in the state of Michigan. Okay, we said, all right, we found a little bit of spotted lanternfly. We detected it. Now we need to do a delimitation survey. And when we do delimitation, we want to find out how big is that infested area? Is it a little spot? Is it uh, a half a mile of infestation? Did it just get here? How long has it been here? We didn't have a whole lot of details. So again, we got the group of about 14 or 16 folks back together, went out two days later, this time had a bigger grid. This time conducted a one mile radius survey. And so, you know, this is a one mile radius, two miles across, that's a big area, right? And we looked in the areas we thought would be most likely that we would find spotted lantern fly. All these areas colored in here in red, that just means we looked in those areas. The contrast is not great, but if you look in the middle of the screen, these dots, pins dropped, the yeses, that's where, where we found spotted lantern fly. Okay, so we're looking at a scenario where spotted lantern fly is just concentrated in, in grids E5 and E6 here on the survey, right? Okay, well, we recorded some of our, our survey efforts. This is where Tree of Heaven was found in the landscape. So you can see there's plenty of Tree of Heaven around here. There's the Clinton River, there's Tree of Heaven growing near the Clinton River. There's a neighborhood here to the south plenty of tree of heaven in that neighborhood. We're gonna use these locations. We're gonna go back to them later on next year to see if spotted lanternfly has spread from this location. All right, so about the site where we found spotted lanternfly. It's on this highlighted piece of property here. This property is actually owned by Oakland County. Oakland County is the owner of this property, which is sort of very fortunate. So we are able to work with Oakland County get access to the site. They've been great to work with. They have done all the insecticide treatments with their you know, licensed and trained applicators here at the site. Um, and it's been fantastic to work in the middle of a very urban area, but have one landowner. Normally in a situation like this, you'd be talking to multiple landowners at once. This has been good to work with just one landowner. All right. So the survey results were that, you know, we found no additional spotted lanternfly outside of this kind of one area that was roughly 20 acres, right? Now that's fairly small if we think about a spotted lanternfly infestation or how quickly these have moved across the United States. And at the time, looked like, it says looked like for these bottom two points, at the time, it seemed to us like we had a scenario where we knew nursery stock had been brought into Michigan early in 2022, I think April, May, I think it was mid-April, had been brought in to Michigan from New Jersey. Well, New Jersey has areas that are heavily infested with spotted lanternfly. And we were actually able to find old egg masses on nursery stock that had come in from New Jersey. So we thought the story was, the talking point was, okay, looks like spotted lanternfly came in on nursery stock from New Jersey and got established here. So there's a potential 
we're looking at year one. This is, these are just the adults that hatched from these egg masses that were brought in on the nursery stock and have dispersed. So it's like, wow, that's, that's pretty fortunate to find year one. Usually you wouldn't find this until two, three years after it's been here. And it's had a number of life cycles and the populations, populations increased. Let's just say that's what it looked like at the time. All right, this is where we found spotted lanternfly. So we spent a lot of time sort of combing the area here. And, you know, about this piece of land, we have a wastewater treatment plant on the left side of the property there. And then we have some sort of dirt, you know, we have dirt lot areas. Uh, we've, there's actually two nursery retailers. One is on, one is right next to the site. And then these two sort of, we call them bowls, right? We think these are basically re overflow retention ponds for the wastewater treatment plant. So we spent a lot of time going over this area, finding where all the tree of heaven was, where it wasn't, and looking for spotted lanternfly. All these, all these pinpoints are locations where we found spotted lanternfly. Right? So we started conducting treatment. We used the trap tree approach. So knowing that we had an infestation of spotted lanternfly, but it wasn't very dense. We weren't seeing hundreds of these things. We were seeing a few here, a few there. On the heaviest and you know, the most heavily infested trees, we saw maybe 40 at a time, not thousands, right? So it's, you know, the best approach there is a trap tree approach. And the trap tree again is where we would remove some tree of heaven from the area. And then we would treat the remaining tree of heaven with systemic insecticide. So on August 16th, we treated uh, a tree of heaven with imidacloprid, and over 90% of the trees in that infested area were treated with imidacloprid. All right. And then on September 14th and 15th, we treated those trees also with dinotepturon. And the reason we did that is that dinotepturon moves through the tree more quickly. You apply it at the, at the base towards the ground and it actually gets translocated throughout the tree. Well, dinotepturon moves more quickly throughout the tree, meaning that if you apply dinotepturon, you'll see control even higher up in the tree where the spotted lanternfly might be feeding, you'll see control quicker. Imidacloprid just, it's a, physically the chemical, the compound is larger. It takes longer to move through the tree. So both insecticides were applied to try and get maximum control, to try and knock down this population of spotted lanternfly as much as we could. And we, you know, while we were conducting all these treatments and doing all this survey, we're collecting all of our data in ArcMap and we're sharing that across multiple organizations. So it's a good, a good way for us to work with other organizations and share data. All right. So while we're doing treatments and while we're recording information about our treatments, um, in early September, we actually found some old egg masses on some of the most heavily infested trees. So that now, now the story shifted a little bit. We were thinking that it had just arrived. It had just arrived and we were looking at eggs, you know, adults that had hatched from eggs that had been brought in on nursery stock. Now it's like, no, nope, story's different now. Now it looks like egg masses were brought in in 2021. So a year before those egg masses, egg masses hatched, spotted lanternfly spread out a little bit. They don't go too terribly far, at least they didn't in this case. And then they, they laid eggs. And then we're looking at sort of year two. We might even be looking at year three. We don't really know. All we know is that we found some old egg masses on a couple of trees in a particular area indicating that it's been in Michigan for at least more than one year. That's all I can really say. That's all the evidence points to. So we've had evidence of eggs being laid and the eggs overwintering in Michigan. All right. So along with looking for spotted lanternfly and doing chemical treatments for spotted lanternfly, um, USDA put up some traps for monitoring and this is a circle trap. So this is sort of a physical trap. We don't have any pheromones. Um, that we would use to attract spotted lanternfly to uh, a trap. So unlike spongy moth or Japanese beetle, um, where they do have pheromones and pheromones are used among insects to communicate. 
and if insects or you know a particular species is using pheromones to communicate you can actually use that to your advantage and you can make synthetic pheromones that'll draw them into a trap maybe it's a, a container they get in and they can't get out or it's a sticky pad that they get stuck to but we haven't you know researchers haven't been able to find any pheromones that are effective at attracting spotted lanternfly so they use a physical trap so the circle trap here I mentioned earlier that spotted lanternfly like to crawl up and down a tree, right? This is basically a device that spotted lanternfly are crawling up the tree. They get funneled into this collection bag here. They get stuck in the bag and that's that. So you can tell if you've had spotted lanternfly in the area. You know, that's probably the most effective way to survey for spotted lanternfly because they're, you know, they're about an inch or an inch and a quarter, inch and a half, and they can be 60 feet up off the ground in a tree. You might not see that insect, even if you're looking for it, right? So traps are a good way to do it. We put some traps out this year to see if we could find any spotted lanternfly that were outside of areas that we knew were infested. We didn't find any. And we'll continue to place traps in the area. USDA will continue to place traps um, to survey for spotted lanternfly. This was trap placement at the site, right? There's our wastewater treatment plant. There's that sort of dog leg shaped area. Placed some all around the site, a little bit outside. Again, didn't find anything. All right, so egg mass survey. So we had spent time looking for adults and we had found them across the site in that 20 acre area. Well, now it's time to look for egg masses. Well, were our treatment efforts successful? You know, we used systemic insecticides on trap trees and we found a whole lot of dead spotted lanternfly out there that had fed on that tree of heaven and ingested the insecticide and had died. Well, how effective was that? Did we get 20% of them? Did we get 50%? Did we get 90%? Now, the only way really to tell is, can you find egg masses in the area, right? And we did egg mass survey. We were out there last week and there were plenty of egg masses. So there are about, I think, 24 egg masses. And if you look here at the map, the map, it's not so easy to see, but we have little blue diamonds on the map. I'll make a better map later on. This is hot off the of presses. So this is, I'm saying map, it's really a screenshot of a ArcGIS uh, map viewer. Um, but we did find egg masses, again, across the same site. So, all right, we knocked their numbers down a bit. I'm sure of that because we saw lots of dead spotted lanternfly, but there was enough remaining to lay egg masses sort of across the site. And if we overlay where we found adults, so the red, the red Y is where adults were found and the blue dots are where we found egg masses. Definitely a strong correlation, right? So it means that, you know, we're, we've got a, a usable degree of accuracy when looking for both eggs and adults. It's not like we found a bunch of adults on one corner and no egg masses, or we found a bunch of egg masses and no adults. There's correlation here. So our survey techniques are at least effective to the level of detection, right? We think about it, you're doing a survey, those egg masses are that big, maybe, right? They're dark brown, the tree that they're being laid on is dark brown. They're, after a couple of days, they're not shiny anymore. You're standing 30 feet back from the tree and you're trying to look up all 40, 50, 60 feet to see if there's an egg mass on that tree. You're not going to see every egg mass. You're not even going to see half the egg masses out there. We were guessing that our detection rate was maybe 20, 30 percent. But if you look at enough sticks, enough trees, enough parts of trees, you can sort of get an idea for where it is and where it is. Right. So this is our last slide here. So moving forward at that site. All right. We know we've got egg masses out there. We're working on plans to treat those egg masses. That'll probably be it's called a horticultural oil. And that is nothing fancier than soybean oil in, that you can spray on the tree. And it basically will cover the egg mass and suffocate the egg mass. Or in some cases, you're using it out of a high pressure sprayer that kind of blasts the egg mass right off the tree, right? So some horticultural oil might be used to treat those egg masses. And we're talking with Michigan State University Extension right now with some scientists that we work with a lot on this. Uh, to formulate our plans going forward, but we'll be back at the site surveying, uh, probably using more systemic insecticides for control and continue to monitor across other parts of the state, both um, USDA, 
MDARD staff, and then some of our conservation districts as well are continuing to monitor. And of course, there's public outreach and responding to reports from the public. You know, for this sort of thing, you know, I've got to ask everybody in the audience, you're the eyes and ears. For any individual state or province or even federal entity, there's only so many people that can go out in the field and actually look for invasive pests, you know, plants, diseases, animals. We rely a lot on public reports, right? Uh, for the state of Michigan, we have our reporting tools. I didn't include them here because this is um, Canadian audience mostly. Um, if you're interested, I can send that information to you. Uh, we do use MISSIN a lot, uh, the Midwest Invasive Species Information Network um, for folks to report. And you can find that through Google. It comes up pretty easily. But with that, I've got my contact information here. If anybody wants to send me a text or an email, uh, phone number and email are there at the bottom. And I suppose we'll open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Rob. That was a great presentation. Very informative. Um, there's a number of questions here, so I'll mm -hmm. read them out to you here. Um, so the first one, do you have compliance agreements for log and mill operators as well? So right now in Michigan, we have compliance agreements for those. There's two nursery retailers right on that site. there, And seeing as how the infestation was probably brought into Michigan via infested nursery stock, I can't say that definitively, right? I can only report what we saw at the site. Those two nursery retailers are under compliance agreement. And their compliance agreements have stipulations in there for inspection and treatment of stock, right? I don't know. I frankly can't, I could say, I don't know if we would have compliance agreements for mills, right? Um, I don't know. I don't think I've heard of other, I know in Pennsylvania they have compliance agreements, but for Pennsylvania, they've used a very heavy, um, should I heavy, but they have a very developed regulatory system where they issue permits for basically the movement of anything across the county. So that, yeah, if you're moving that lumber across the county, you would need to have a permit. And that, you know, those permit conditions are for, you know, visual inspection, right? But for Michigan, I don't know what we would have for um, a lumber operation or a mill or anyone doing any, you know, wood retail. Thank you so much. Um, the next question here, um, are less heavily invaded states like Michigan and New York in a position to pursue eradication or are they too mm -hmm. well established and past that point? Eradication is a tricky word, right? We use suppression because if you start talking about eradication, you set up the expectation that you can get every single last spotted lanternfly and their egg masses. And that is very difficult to do. I don't know of any successful eradication attempts in any other states across the United States, counties, areas, right? The one way to really look at this is that the actions that we're taking to suppress or slow the spread, you're buying time. There's a whole bunch of people at USDA, at state institutions, at universities, public and private, that are doing research on spotted lanternfly. There's research going on in pheromones, on basic biology, why they do what they do, what they're looking for, how much do they need tree of heaven. There's research ongoing about uh, regarding um, Parasitoids, parasitic wasps, so biocontrol agents. Uh, biocontrol has been decently successful with emerald ash borer. There's a number of biocontrol agents that are currently being released and they're finding these in the field. Um, so you're buying time. That's what you're really doing. If you can, you know, if we can suppress those numbers at that site, we might, or we should be able to slow the spread throughout the state of Michigan. That's not to say it can be introduced in another way, but you know, we've got that one pocket here that we need to address. Awesome, thank you. What border controls are in place both between states within the US and between USDA and CFIA along the international border? Ontario is keen to keep this bug out, especially considering the potential impact on Niagara wine country. Mm. So if it's in between states or it's in between countries, that's the purview of the USDA, right? So state of Michigan, we can have internal and external quarantines. Uh, an internal quarantine would prevent the movement of uh, good or material in between counties. An external would prevent introduction of a good. And we have a number of external quarantines for um, 
southern pine beetle or hemlock woolly adelgid or balsam woolly adelgid, right? Uh, known forest pests. In different states, there's sort of different approaches to quarantine. Pennsylvania was the first state to have spotted lanternfly show up and they have a very developed regulatory program, again, requiring permits and uh, sort of a train the trainer approach of inspections, right? Between the United States and Canada, I don't know. That would be something that's happening at a federal level. Uh, and if someone's really interested in that, I can point you to some folks at USDA. Just go ahead and send me an email and we can get you an answer for that. Okay, thank you. Um, the next person here says, emailing from Ontario Government Extension, wondering if you would be able to share your inspection slash sampling protocol when you have an SLF sighting. Yeah, uh, we do have we do have protocols that we came up with for both our survey of adults, survey for adults, and for egg mass survey, and I can share those. Yeah, if you just email me directly, um, you know, basically it's about breaking up the area into a grid and determining how many individual trees you want to look at per grid. And you know, the the limiting factor there is manpower. Do you have a hundred people or do you have ten people, and how much land do you have to cover? right? So you don't need to find all of them. You just need to find out sort of the extent of where the infestation is or is not. And then you can move into a trap tree approach or in some areas they're using broadcast sprays. Um, but yeah, those approaches would be different in Canada based on what chemical control options are available. Okay, thank you. So we have two questions here that are somewhat similar. Um, what is the flight range of adult SLF? Could they cross the Detroit River into Windsor or the Niagara River unassisted? And this other person here along the same line says, what is the wind dispersal distance potential with spotted lantern fly? Great questions, yeah. So there is a fella, um, he's retired now, but I got the pleasure of uh, watching his presentation on flight characteristics of spotted lantern fly. The take home message there is that they're poor flyers. They are not, they are not a box tree moth. You know, box tree moth can go 15 miles. Um, spotted lantern fly, I don't remember the distance. I mean, it was recorded in meters and it wasn't a whole lot, but they basically, what they will do is um, the females, mated females will have a dispersal event. And as I mentioned before, they like to crawl up structures. So again, if you're looking for spotted lanternfly, even looking at telephone poles, they'll go up to the top of a telephone pole. They will go up an object. They orient themselves into the wind. They jump off and they fly for 11 seconds. And they're, they're kind of flying, they're kind of gliding, they're sinking, right? They don't go very far. So this isn't a miles kind of thing. This is under a mile, this is under half a mile. This is under a quarter of a mile, right? So they don't fly very well on their own. They're very poor flyers. Um, wind, of course, yeah, you can have wind dispersal. We think maybe we had some wind dispersal at our site. We had a couple very high wind events throughout the summer. You know, it's hard to say if the wind did that or if they moved there on their own, but yeah, wind dispersal is possible, but this isn't the kind of thing, this isn't, like I said, box tree moth, which can do 15 miles, right? They're poor flyers, they don't go very far. So chances of them themselves crossing over the river, I would say pretty low, right? But chance of them, chance of an egg mass being moved, pretty high, right? One thing I didn't mention here is that spotted lanternfly um, other states are reporting that they really like to lay egg masses on rusted metal. That sort of, think of like a big piece of construction equipment that doesn't have, that's paints chipped away on an area or a railroad car. And they've got that real high quality steel that rusts and turns dark brown and gets pitted like sandpaper feeling. They really like to lay egg masses on that. And if we think of a rail yard, anybody's ever been to a rail yard, maybe some of the invasive species folks have up there in Canada, I'm sure they have. Those are very disturbed areas. Those are, and they've been very disturbed for a very long time. There's probably some weird chemicals in those soils, right? Mm -hmm. Well, Tree of Heaven loves, loves roadsides, loves rail sides, loves rail yards. I mean, any rail yard here in the state of Michigan, I guarantee you're gonna find Tree of Heaven. So you've got a bunch of Tree of Heaven. You have a bunch of rail cars that sit for a long period of time that definitely have the ability for egg masses to be laid on them. So again, they're finding in other places of, you know, North America, Pennsylvania, that spotted lanternfly is moving around along rail lines. And that's how it moved into Ohio. Spotted lanternfly moved into hot into Ohio. Egg masses were either laid on train cars or were laid on trash that was brought from 
New Jersey, I believe, into a landfill in Ohio. And that's how spotted lanternfly spread to Ohio, was on either train cars or garbage, right? So egg masses, that's how it's spread. That's how it's gone long distances. Oh, really good to know, thank you. Um, this next question here says, if, if SLS has, SLF has a tendency to aggregate, but an aggregation pheromone hasn't been identified, is yeah. it possible they aggregate visually? Has anyone managed to bait SLF onto a tree with a decoy insect? I haven't heard anything about decoy insects. Um, I saw one presentation, uh, a researcher was looking into vibrations, that, that, that maybe they're attracted to certain frequencies. And this was because they were noticing, it's kind of a, an interesting story. Um, they were noticing that there were these uh, big cables that were going up to ships that were it, in port on the east coast and the spotted lanternfly really loved the cables for some reason and the only thing they could come up with is that the cables happened to vibrate at a particular frequency and so this researcher has done a bunch of research seeing if spotted lanternfly respond to any any sort of frequencies if they if they're attracted to it and what i recall from the presentation is that the the results were very mixed it seemed like maybe there was a potential here or there but I don't think there were any significant differences. Haven't heard anything about any decoys. Um, and we don't have any decent pheromones yet. Um, I think USDA has just started using, they've just started using a particular chemical. I, I think it's basically um, a tree decoy chemical or a tree stress chemical. I don't remember the name of it or, or what it even was supposed to uh, synthesize or be a replicant of, but uh, apparently that's showed very mixed results as well. Kind of like if you're familiar with it, the purple trap, the color purple and the purple traps for EAB, there's a couple people on the call nodding their heads. Well, they were the color purple because they did a study and found that there was a tiny increase in purple and that was probably just noise in the data. So, but you gotta have a color, so they went with purple. <laughs> very interesting, all right. Um, are the egg masses able to survive on the ground over winter? Wondering if spongy moth are able to. Yeah, yeah. So you got to crush them. You got to get them. You got to crush them, or you got to get them into soapy water or hand sanitizer. Yeah, you can't. If you just like scrape it off the tree with the bark behind it or something with a knife, there's a good chance they'll survive on the ground. Okay. Now, just a few more questions here. Sure. Um, do you have or have you noticed preference for sticky band traps versus circle traps? We're not using sticky bands, we're using circle traps. That's what USDA uses, and they're the ones, you know, in our in our partnership, they're they're leading the effort on trapping. And we find that we like using the, the circle traps because then I I know that if a an adult or an even immature went up that tree, it's gonna get into that funnel and it'll be in that collection bag or cup. There was some research, there was a paper where they looked at the efficacy of all the traps. And in some cases, um, you know, a sticky band trap, anybody who's worked with sticky anything for, you know, a sticky band trap or a sticky card in a European fruit fly trap, European cherry fruit fly trap or anything like that, they get fouled by dust or other debris very quickly. If you put a sticky trap near a dirt road, it's no good after three, four days, right? So they were finding that sticky band traps that had been out there for even like a, like a week or more, there was some kind of number. After a number of days, the adults, in some cases, the adults were able to power their way through the sticky stuff. Now they are effective at lowering numbers, but if there's one lone adult, uh, I'm gonna use a circle trap if I wanna find just that one in that area. Okay, good to know. Um, this person here wants to hear your thoughts on the use of emamectin benzoate versus using neonicotinoid um, insecticides. More often, uh, yes, with the use of neonics. Yeah, I mean, so we, yeah, you can use both. Um, we have good experience using systemic neonics here in the state because we do a lot of treatment for hemlock woolly adelgid. And so we do a lot of dinotephuron application for hemlock woolly adelgid and some imidacloprid application. Um, it works well for us. We find good residual in the trees, especially in hemlocks. Um, so that it's like a known quantity, right? And you're applying it, it's not a broadcast spray, right? I know there's concerns around neonics. It's not a broadcast spray. You're applying it either via injection. They, for imidacloprid, they use the Wedgel injection system or basal bark spray. 
So we're using limited quantities of it in a targeted approach. It's, you know, other states here, like in other regions, they're using broadcast sprays of bifenthrin, which is just, that's a broad spectrum insecticide. It'll just, it'll fry everything in that particular wood line. Um, we're not doing that right now. Okay, good to know. And there's just one more question here from the chat. Um, is there any indication that this insect could go um, semi voltine if climatic conditions force them to? So could climate um, extend their development, for example? I don't know. That's a question for, it's a question for a PhD, right? I'm mm -hmm. just at the master's level. I'm, I'm the guy organizing the survey. You know, we've talked a little bit about, you know, hey, maybe some of the northern parts of Michigan are, you know, maybe too cold. And, you know, the answer so far has been like, yeah, maybe some of the coldest parts of Michigan are too cold. And there have been some models out of, um, was it Penn State, where they, based on the model, it said that there was only a couple counties in Michigan where there would be enough growing degree days for spotted lanternfly to complete their life cycle. Um, that model indicated that Oakland County, I think it was like Oakland and Wayne County, which is Metro Detroit, would be warm enough, potentially because of heat island effects. Um, and that's where we find it right now. I, in talking with Dr. Deb McCullough from Michigan State University, she said like, no, they'll, they'll find a way at least in the lower peninsula here in Michigan, I don't suspect that we'll have any areas that are too cold. But again, that's one of those things that, you know, spotted lanternfly hasn't been here too long. And um, that's one of those things that people are still trying to hash out. How cold is too cold, right? Where, where, where can they go and where can't they go? Right, all right. Well, thank you so much. That's all the questions we've had today. Um, but I really appreciate you answering all those questions and for your presentation, it was really great. Um, I'm just going to take over here and share my screen. Um, so thank you again, Rob, for your presentation. It was really great. Um, thank you, everybody else, for listening in today. Um, please answer the survey questions following the webinar. We would really appreciate that. Um, we have a webinar coming up on December 6th um, entitled uh, Coming in Hot, Early Detection and Rapid Response Priorities in Southeast Michigan. Um, so hoping to see you there um, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thanks, everyone.